This is Derek Hanna. I will introduce you. Um, Derek is currently a visiting fellow at Yale Law School in the Information Society Project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I first uh, e-met him. It's the first time we've met physically, but um, I first became aware of Derek uh, um, a few months ago when a report came out that got widely circulated very quickly on the web because it was from the Republican Study Group and it was about the myths of copyright with the number of proposals for copyright reform and it was circulating to a large degree because first of all it was engagingly written it was very nicely written and from a certain point of view which i'll say is mine uh, may not be shared it made a lot of sense it was a really a straightforward um exposition of some things that were obvious as soon as as the report said them and some reforms that seemed to be eminently sensible and it was coming from the Republican study group, and so it got a lot of attention and certainly was very interesting to me. Um, we got to know each other a bit through mm -hmm. Twitter mm -hmm. and email and the like. Um, Derek has gone on to um, the most, uh, most recent um, uh, project that you've initiated was a White House petition in response to the making illegal of jailbreaking your phones, which is that approximately right? Unlocking your phones, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, for use across networks, uh, which was the most popular, most signed White House petition ever. Is that correct? As of then, yeah. As of, it's been surpassed? <laughs> I think it has been, yeah. Do you know by what? Um, uh, the CISPO one got pretty high, too. Okay. But. Nevertheless, a massively successful uh, White House petition. Um, and so Derek is going to talk with us about oh, sort of political activism in the age of the net. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Derek. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the copyright memo. I don't want to dwell too much time on it, not because I'm not interested in it, but because I've written about it. I can take questions in the Q&A. But I'd rather talk a little bit about how we kind of connect the dots, because I, I assume that many of you in this room have kind of a consensus on some things that need to be reformed on technology policy. And the question is, why doesn't Washington get it? And how can we connect the dots between the two? And I like to talk. Uh, um, I like to talk to point out that um, I'm not that partisan of a guy. I feel like on technology policy, the dominant divide is between those who get it, which is this room, <laughs> and those who don't get it. And as liberals or, or Republicans or conservatives, however you define yourself, we can quibble on some of the details. But I feel like that's kind of an incidental conversation to that broader one of how do we even have the conversation on the topic of what is worthwhile for the economy and innovation? How do we even frame the discussions in that way? What I mean by that is copyright law hasn't really been assessed in at least 15 years since the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998. That's evidence of a system that's not even self-questioning. That's not even inquisitive on these issues of tech policy. And so I'm hoping to, hope to connect some of the dots for you guys in this room and figure out uh, how you guys can be useful going forward and talk about some of my work. All right. Disruptive innovation, you guys all know that term. This is Harvard, the university that conned, or Clay uh, uh, Christensen conned that term. Um, you guys are the first ones, by the way, that I've used a PowerPoint presentation on, so you're kind of the guinea pig. And I'm not so good at it. All right. Um, my backstory I'm a Massachusetts guy, worked for Governor Romney, worked for Senator Scott Brown's campaign, came up with Senator Scott Brown. Went to Washington, D.C., worked for Senator Scott Brown during SOPA, and then went over to the House Republican Study Committee. Now, as far as my conversation today, I'm trying to loosely frame it around three key rules that I see as key rules for activism in the technology realm. Number one, being right is just part of the battle. So we can all agree in this room that the white right way to proceed on copyright is X, but being right is not inherently enough to win the political battle. Number two, it's less important what you say, it's more important how you say it, and it's most important who says it. And number three, which is kind of related, is the framing of the issue is everything. Now, what do I mean by framing? I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But it's basically how you present and conceive of the issue in general. Um, so to, you know, to the, the layman, the idea of copyright is it's dealing specifically with content. But I think many of us know in this room that the issues of copyright are actually much more they, they touch a number of other issues. And so our intellectual framing of an issue like copyright is very detached from the intellectual framing on Capitol Hill. And so that framing is really critical in how SOPA was won and how future battles will be won and lost. 
So starting out on SOPA. Um, so that quote is from Adam Green. He says, it's not a battle of left versus right. Frankly, it's a battle of old versus new, which is a similar point to what I'm saying before. Those who get it and those who don't get it. Um, just pointing out how dramatic of an incident SOPA was for someone who worked on Capitol Hill at the time is there was you know, enormous energy behind this. For weeks we had seen uh, you know, the, the, the danger clouds growing, but the amount of money that was in favor of SOPA was quite overwhelming. And they had been lobbying on this for about three years. And I remember telling all my friends about how terrible this bill was back when it was COICA. And it just seemed like there was no opposition at all. And then out of nowhere in that last month, you know, this real groundswell came of about three million people reaching out to their members of Congress, uh, you know, crashing con congressional circuit boards and websites, tweeting and Facebooking. Most of us had never seen anything like this ever before. The big thing for me was not only did, did members come out against this bill, that happens all the time, but members who had come out and were co-sponsoring the bill decided that they were now against their own legislation. That's never happened before to my knowledge, and it was quite astounding. Now, I was very pleased that Senator Scott Brown actually came out against SOPA. He had never co-sponsored SOPA. Uh, and there were many members like Senator Scott Brown, but uh, uh, something like 40 or 50 members had actually co-sponsored and actually reversed their decisions. And I wanted to briefly uh, give my perspective on the real story of SOPA. I think there's been a kind of revisionist history in the past year to say that SOPA was a battle of, you know, it was Google. It was Google and Wikipedia and some other big companies that came in and killed SOPA. If you ask anyone who worked on Capitol Hill, they'll tell you the real story. And the real story is three million people reached out to the member of Congress and killed this. And it was people like Elizabeth Stark, Alexis Ohanian, Aaron Schwartz. And it was other people who were on the ground in Washington, D.C., who understood the process a little bit a little bit better, but didn't have the technology credentials, and helped connect the dots between the two. And that's really what helped you know, change this movement. Uh, I think that, that this revisionist story is a, is a uh, worthwhile one, both for Google, but also for the Chamber of Commerce, RAA, and MPAA. They don't want to admit that they lost to average people. It's much better for them to say, we lost to Google. I think that will help you keep your job. Sorry. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this video. Uh, this is from uh, Mario Salvio at U UC Berkeley. It's a really uh, pretty cool quotation. I'm, uh, I'm not going to play the video for you, but he talks about how when the system is so awry that you have to throw your gears on the fundamental working of the system and say, I'm not going to take part in the system anymore. And to me, that was what SOPA was. It was, it was three million people reaching out to the member of Congress and saying that we're not going to sit passively by. We're actually going to intervene in this process and, and muck up the gears, as he would call it. Um, so after SOPA, as someone who worked on tech policy, the most common question that I received on any tech bill is, is this SOPA? And I almost don't know how to respond because I didn't know if they were literally asking if this was SOPA reincarnated or if, if this is going to piss off people like SOPA. But this is the most common question. And, and Lufgren had said SOPA was inevitable before it was unthinkable. I think that's a, a good uh, illustration of it. Now, the why do I talk about SOPA in, in context of what I'm doing and what I'm talking about? Because in SOPA, they, they mastered all the rules that I'm talking about here. The framing was perfect. Um, the actors who were making the message was perfect. The framing was, this is going to censure the internet. It's actually going to hurt and hinder innovation. And those who were saying it were left, right, and center. It was venture capitalists like Brad Burnham who was saying, I don't invest in companies that deal with copyright laws because of these crazy copyright laws, and this is going to hurt innovation. And it was guys like Alexis Ohanian who was saying, my website, Reddit, won't be able to function anymore in this world. Or Ben Ha saying, cheeseburgers won't be able to function in this world. And so it was this really united movement that had kind of the talking points of the left and the right. And now, linking to my memo. Um, so that's me, uh, my boss, Jim Jordan. Uh, so I was always interested in tech policy and copyright law in particular. And so we reached out to all our members of Congress trying to figure out who wanted to work on copyright law. No one responded. I was told to write a report on copyright law. And the way I started was this fundamental reframing of the issue, what became the three myths. So on copyright, this is the dominant frame today on Capitol Hill and in Washington, D.C. And this is the result of 15 year plus of RAA, MPAA lobbying. Basically, piracy is bad, costs American jobs, copyright's good. What I call copyright plus is even better. What is copyright plus? Copyright plus is a system that means 
copyright should go on for life plus 70 years. Copyright plus is a system that says it's logical for individuals to be liable for a billion dollars of damages. That's copyright plus. That's something far removed from what is traditionally defined as copyright. And that only exists in a world where you're so scared of American jobs being lost to piracy. So my first goal was, how can I change this narrative? How can I talk about copyright reform without dealing with some of the issues of piracy, without discounting their arguments on the impact on American jobs? And we can have an intellectual conversation in this room about the real impact on piracy, but that's not really the conversation on Capitol Hill. And uh, at CPAC about a month ago, I was on a debate that kind of went like that, where there were five people, they all said piracy is bad, cost American jobs, copyright is good. And I went and I said, you know, this is your argument so far, is that correct? They nodded their head. And what I said to them, which may not work in this room, but it works in a conservative audience, is who in this room thinks that terrorism is bad? Everyone raises their hand. Who in this room thinks the TSA is the only way to protect us on an airplane? No one raised their hand. And then I posited the question, can we have a system that deals with piracy and protects content holders that isn't so crazy as to make 23 million Americans felons for unlocking and jailbreaking their iPhones? Can we do that? And the answer is yes. There's nothing about you know, dealing with piracy or you know, protecting copyright holders that requires these asinine systems. And, and that's the logic train that I'm trying to, to parrot. Um, so these are the three myths I pointed out. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but basically talking about the main purpose of copyright, that it's not free market, that it doesn't lead to the most innovation and productivity. Um, I call it a Goldilocks-like predicament. Uh, just one, one point in this slide, hashtag what would the founding fathers do? I just came up with that. Um, so this is the original copyright law of our founding fathers. Also, for that matter, there was the, the system under Great Britain, the Statute of Anne. And this is the current copyright law today. Life of the author plus 70 years. So you can see there's a, a pretty significant distach there. And I think that, the, that the, the liberal response to this is that doesn't seem fair. That's hurting the consumer. I think the Republican conservative response to this is, wait, the, the above is what the founding fathers wanted, and that's kind of consistent with the Constitution. And the bottom is wildly divergent from what the Constitution actually says. I think it's important to try to frame these issues in both left and right polarity. Um, and these are the policy solutions I talked about. Um, I could talk about these in the Q&A, but I don't think it's that radical here. Um, and after the memo came out, we got overwhelming support from conservative groups on the right. American conservative unions up there, you may, got, you may not know about it, but they're the ones who put on CPAC. They represent every conservative organization in Washington, D.C. They came out, put it on the front page, and endorsed it. And um, so we were actually very surprised by the amount of support that we got from conservative circles. Um, so why did I take on copyright? I think we need creative destruction of failed ideas. I think this leads to more innovation. Um, should we, should we skip a, oh there, this is an important one. So the memo was officially written, officially approved, it went through all the normal processes, and uh, we expected it to be very controversial, um, but we thought it was an important thing to put out nonetheless. And the point of the memo, again, was to try to reframe the debate. Because none of those things were dealing with the issues of piracy. They are saying that we can have a different, more rational system that protects copyright. All right, so memo comes out. Memo gets pulled in 24 hours. Two weeks later, I'm told that I'm out of a job. So January 6th is my last day at work. And my question was, you know, what can I do from here going forward to kind of connect the dots? To learn from what people on the outside did during SOPA and what I knew on the inside through the copyright memo and try to leverage it going forward. Because it's one thing when you're on the inside to go for the big play. But I believe that when you're on the outside, we need to go for the small strategic battles. So I wrote about it in Boing Boing. I said SOPA was impressive. But stopping legislation is one thing. Actually putting new legislation on the table and actually utilizing the mechanisms that are designed for failure, that's another, that's another level of expertise. And that requires you to learn the, the rules of Washington, D.C. Uh, while those in this room and across the country in the tech community may not want to be playing by the exact same parameters, you have to understand how D.C. operates and then attempt to hack that process. So understand how it works. We don't have to do the exact same thing that the content industry does, but just understand how they work. And a key case in point is, a few weeks ago, the head of the Copyright Office uh, testified in the Judiciary Committee 
actually endorsed many of the reforms that I talked about, things like lowering the length of copyright, calling for a, a, a great new copyright act, uh, updating copyright for the digital generation. Before she testified, the day before, the content industry published an editorial in Roll Call, again making this argument. Um, copyright law has copyright has led to this massive innovation in the United States. It's one of the great U.S. exports. Why would we want to tamper with it and change it? That's not being done by the other side. There was one editorial in roll call. There was no countering editorial in roll call, and that's because the RAA and the MPA are there on the ground. They know how to utilize the process. They know that roll call is read by every member of Congress and their staff. And we need to have that level of expertise and understanding the internal workings of Congress if we want to fix Congress. Um, so this is what I talked about in, in my, my Boing Boing piece, and I gave a whole bunch of pointers on how to reform technology law in general. Um, number one, don't wait for the next SOPA. SOPA's not coming back. It's not. Um, they learned their lesson. And what is that lesson? That it was a big overplay of their hand, and that there are much smarter and more insidious ways to accomplish their goals. What do I mean by that? Okay, so one of the worst provisions of SOPA was deal was taking down these rogue websites, specifically taking it down for American citizens, but taking down these rogue websites. They've been able to do most of that through ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement, as some of you in this room obviously know. Hundreds of websites, even Mega Upload was taken down the week after SOPA. Um, the other part of SOPA that was pretty pretty uh, significant was payment processing, getting MasterCard and Visa to shut off funding for Pirate Bay. Um, they were able to accomplish that without legislation. Uh, and the third part is getting um, you know, Google and other websites to take down uh, links to torrents and other pirating, infringing content. Um, they were also able to accomplish that. So in a world where they've accomplished those three main goals, why would they try to come up with the next SOPA? That's probably not their design plan. Instead, they're trying to utilize our international trade agreements to lock in intellectual property law going forward which is what they've been successful in doing. The past 12 intellectual uh, um, uh, international treaties include stock language that basically codifies the Digital Millennium Copyright Act forever. Now, that's a big problem because Digital Millennium Copyright Act is domestic law, and it should actually, you know, intellectual property law should change as the economy changes. Um, but they were very smart to the point where today this is just stock language that you put in any treaty, and it's going to be in the, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty um, and then, and then some. It's it's rumored that the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty is going to include Life Plus 70, which is a further uh, ramping up of the international treaty system. So if you can do these things through treaty, through the back door, in a way that the American citizens are not really aware of, and in a way that only requires approval from the Senate, or if you're really smart, you do it as an executive agreement, which is the same thing as a treaty except it doesn't require approval, which is what ACTA was, um, then you can avoid ever dealing with the SOPA problem ever again. I say that not to dis disenchant you guys who are waiting on the sidelines for the next SOPA, but to say that we have to be more activist rather than passive if we actually want to help solve the problem. Um, we need to analyze existing law. Uh, before SOPA, there was the DMCA, and the DMCA was extremely controversial when it passed. Um, there are many provisions in the DMCA that are just as odious or nearly just as odious as SOPA is. Um, number four is my, my most interesting. Report, support will require, it will require support from both the left and the right, which is, again, is can we frame these arguments in ways that appeal to the left and the right? Um, number five, we all have our own issues, pet projects, things that we find particularly interesting, but we need to figure out how we can work together as a collective whole, because that's what SOPA was. SOPA was a broad segment of the American people, a diverse coalition that had never assembled together, coming under one banner. And number six is my most, my favorite, kind of the Sun Tzu thing, is you have to focus upon asymmetrical warfare. Where are you strong and they are weak? Where have they overplayed their hand? So SOPA was a key one where they overplayed their hand. But are there other examples of U.S. law that have had such an incredible, I mean, a, a, a crazy impact that it makes your argument much more easy? So what I mean by that is, is if you want to take on wholesale copyright law, um, that's not asymmetric warfare. There's a strong argument on the other side. Copyright law has created all this, this content, all this innovation. Why would you tamper with it? But what I wanted to find was the asymmetric war, the asymmetric battles that didn't have a very strong counter argument.
Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the ad from Apple. You should watch it. It's pretty good. Um, basically, he says, you know, we are the pirates. We need to think different. We, we, we are the innovators. Um, the, it ends with the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. Um, so overall, my thesis is, and I don't mean to say this to be disrespectful, but we lack the institutional capacity to quickly intervene in the political process in the way that the content industry does. We need to be smarter and more tactical. Big battles require ramping up and reframing the issue, require a solid coalition going into them, and frankly, they require winning small battles first. The content industry did not start with the Sonny Bono Act, which was the fundamental reshaping of copyright law. They started with smaller, incidental battles going forward. Um, and you can see that I mean, a variety of movement politics. I'm not an expert in movement politics, but you can see that in, in, uh, you know, in women's rights. You can see that in, in, in um, you know, rights for minorities, uh, for the gay community. Every movement politics across this country has started small and worked their way up. And, and that's, if I could impress one thing upon you guys, it's that we should start with the small battles and work our way up rather than looking for the big kahuna. Um, small, highly strategic affirmative victories. Um, these are the things that it will do. Um, the coalition's important. The dialogue and framing is important. Number three and number four are also critical. Uh, number three is kind of more of don't rub the conservatives the wrong way. Um, you don't want to be perceived as fighting the man. You know that you know companies are evil. They're stealing all of our profits. Um, that's a very counterproductive message when one party basically perceives itself as the party of business. So how are you ever going to win over a party that sees themselves as the party of business? And intellectually, many of you in this room may say, well, why would we want to win them over? It's because you have to get 51% of Congress. So <laughs> we're going to have to figure out a narrative that deals with the man argument. Um, and number four, create a David versus Goliath narrative, which is important because if you want to create a sustained movement and campaign, you need to get media attention. And the media likes the narrative of the David versus Goliath story more than any other, in, in at least my experience. Uh, you don't want to talk about piracy. You want to run away from piracy, um, at least for now. Um, and the DMCA may need to be completely replaced, but those are non-stars on Capitol Hill. So right now there's a movement underfoot basically saying that we should completely get rid of the DMCA. Well, that's an interesting intellectual conversation. Um, but what you're doing, if you're being tactical about implementing that on Capitol Hill, is saying, I want to go to war with the RA, MPA, Chamber of Commerce, but also every tech company. I also want to go to war with Facebook and with Google and with Twitter. And I want to go to war with Hattery that represents small, innovative companies. <laughs> so who do you have on your side in that type of a battle? That's not necessarily the smartest way to proceed, um, is going against some of the better actors in the tech industry. So my first campaign was on the issue of cell phone unlocking. Um, so I don't know how familiar you guys are on this. I can speed up or slow down depending on your level of expertise. I assume many of you in this room actually understand this issue even better than I do. Um, but cell phone unlocking is, broadly speaking, where you change the settings on your phone, usually through an unlocking code, to allow your phone to be used on another carrier. So you travel abroad, you can buy a SIM card when you get off the aircraft and use your phone over there, or if you have a phone in the United States, you can use it to switch carriers. Um, so if you analyze the U.S. market versus international markets, you'll realize that we pay about 400 to 800% more than other countries uh, for slower speeds than other countries. And I would argue that the locking technology is one of the main reasons uh, for that disparity is because it's difficult to have a thriving competitive market where you have these monopolies, uh, sorry, not monopolies isn't exactly the right word, these contractual um, walled gardens of, you know, iPhone and other, other, other carriers. And so unlocking is one of the few technologies that allowed for customers to compete. A similar technology before was keeping your phone number, which none of the phone companies wanted customers to be able to do, and it required a, a legislation from Congress to say customers should be able to keep their phone numbers from one carrier to the other. So I took on this issue because AT&T and Verizon petitioned the Library of Congress to make this technology illegal. Effectively, what actually happened was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act always made unlocking and jailbreaking illegal. The librarian was giving exceptions. 
the librarian decided to not give an exception because they were asked by the big wireless companies that also incidentally spend $32 million a year lobbying, and this is one of their top reported issues. Um, and AT&T and Verizon, of course, don't want unlocking because customers are able to switch to other carriers. Less so with Verizon. Um, so it was my first article in The Atlantic. Um, I thought the above was a little bit funny. Um, I'm pro-choice with regard to my smartphone. I hope my congressman is as well. That actually was too controversial. They actually took, they got rid of that line. It was censured by The Atlantic. Um, so the other things I point out in the article is um, technology for the blind also has to get approval every three years. You know, can you imagine a more onerous regulation than one that requires the Association for the Blind to petition every three years? It, it doesn't make any sense. And the idea that Americans can be liable for five years in prison for this is a crazy and stark example of how much the copyright system has been abused. And that was one of the reasons I focused on this issue. Uh, and I talked about um, you know, over federal overcriminalization. But overall, I expected this battle to be a tough one. It's a very complicated technological issue that few people actually understand. I mean, I spent most of my conversations and media appearances trying to explain what unlocking is. Um, and it's a very legal, complicated legal issue. In fact, I was the first one to demonstrate legally that this made you liable for five years in prison. No one had done the legal analysis to, to find out what the actual penalty was. Um, so people didn't understand it. People didn't understand what it meant. Uh, it didn't get any real media attention. The tech blogs aren't real media attention. I mean, it didn't get any mainstream media attention. Uh, it had a $32 million industry protecting it, and it had no discernible counter lobby. One of the most unfortunate things about Capitol Hill is whenever you talk about a new policy idea, they always ask where the game board is. Who's on your side? Because I know who's on the other side, but who's on your side? And on this issue, when I talked to congressmen, I said, well, America? <laughs> like, innovation? New companies, new market models. Um, that's a real problem in Capitol Hills. We don't have a lobby group for the future. We don't have anyone articulating what what industry, what market models could be. And so it's kind of a hypothetical argument. Well, if we allowed for unlocking, then we may have these SIM cards that people could buy. But as the campaign went went further, the examples became more stark and more obvious on the innovations that we were actually inhibiting. So one of my favorite examples is a company called Republic Wireless. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them. They're a, okay, probably a board member, right? Oh, a huge fan. So what they do is they do a $19 all-you-can-eat, unlimited data, unlimited voice, unlimited text plan. The catch is, if you're in a Wi-Fi zone, it automatically jumps on Wi-Fi. If you're not in a Wi-Fi zone, it goes on Sprint. It's not that complicated. It makes a lot of sense, particularly when we have a big spectrum crunch in this, problem, in this country and you're able to offload all that data chunk. Unfortunately, that requires essentially a, a specialized version of the operating system. So if you have another uh, phone, you're going to have to root the phone or jailbreak the phone on an iPhone. They only have a relationship with one carrier, uh, sorry, with one handset. And frankly, it's kind of a crummy phone. So realistically, their biggest impediment to growth today is customers being able to take over good phones, unlock those phones to Republic Wireless, and use it with Republic Wireless. And in a world where phones are quickly becoming commodities, and we can disagree on that, but Broadly speaking, I think that phones are becoming commodities. Um, you can imagine a world where your two-year-old phone is essentially as good as your current phone and you would like to port it over, or portering it over is something that's suboptimal but worthwhile because of the savings overall. Uh, the other issue is there was no partisan advantage for either party, um, and it was the result of an unelected bureaucrat from the legislative branch that also no one understood. But we succeeded in a White House petition that got to 114,000 signatures, uh, making cell phone unlocking legal. And it was able to do this partially because of the coalition that it already assembled for SOPA. Uh, and it was able to do this because everyone had a cell phone. They quickly understood that this affected them personally, even if it didn't really affect them personally. But they just had an experience with the technology underneath. And it was able to grow because it had arguments on the left and arguments on the right. The argument on the left is, again, primarily one of fairness. Customers should be able to do what they want with their own device. The argument on the right, oh, sorry, their own device, also cell phone companies are kind of evil. Uh, on the right was, if you bought the phone, it's your property, 
and if it's your property, then you should do whatever you want with it. Very similar arguments, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's almost like how you parse the language and how you talk about the issue. Fairness versus property rights. That's not that, uh, you know, entirely accurate, but that's a broad, um, you know, a, a broad sample on, on kind of the discussion. And my, my kind of added value was trying to pitch this as an issue of innovation, which I think is a cross-partisan issue. If you talk about things in, in, in the realm of new competition, new market models, and innovation overall, I think you can win over a whole new crop of people. So after we got the petition to 114,000 signatures, uh, the, the first the FCC announced investigation. That was pretty cool. Uh, then the White House came out and endorsed unlocking. Uh, the language that I use in my articles were that it's anti, it's, it's, um, it's again, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make it, un, uh, the, the, sorry, it's anti-common sense is the term I use in, in the Atlantic. They actually quoted my term anti-common sense, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, but basically the White House came out and said customers should be able to unlock their phones, and this is an important part of a competitive and thriving market. And the interesting thing was, before the White House did this, I had been reaching out to members of Congress since early January when the ruling went into effect and said, get in front of this issue. Make this your issue because you're going to have lots of people who support you, but don't wait for the White House to act. I particularly made this argument to the right because I worried that after Obama endorsed it, they would not want to touch it. Uh, and, and what we had was we had Representative DeFazio who tweeted in favor of it. We had Tea Party Nation, which tweeted in favor of it. Sorry, we came out in favor of it, emailed all the Tea Party groups. We had the National College Republicans, Young Americans for Liberty, EFF, Public Knowledge, um, and Vint Cerf, just to name a few. And I'm pretty sure that that coalition has never existed before <laughs> on any issue. And that's, that was the power of this issue, because each of them had their own social circles. The people that the National College Republicans were talking to and sending it to college Republican chapters across the country were not the same people that EFF was talking to out in California. And, and I, I was wrong. Three hours after the White House endorsed, Congressman Jason, Jason Chaffetz from Utah, one of the most conservative members of Congress, uh, he tweeted in favor of unlocking. Um, and I did hear from some members of Congress saying, oh, Obama endorsed it, you know, F that. But for the most part, the response on the right was Chaffetz's response. Uh, we got a number of bills introduced in Congress, both on the Senate side and on the House side. This is not an overwhelming success. There were failures along the way. There were things to be learned from. Most importantly, we had the institutional capacity to get the White House petition to 114,000 signatures. But we lost all the data along the way. We don't know who those 114,000 people are. We had no ability to communicate with them. Uh, and as a result, after that petition hit the number and after the bills are introduced, we have no ability to mobilize those people and say, this bill's good, these other five bills are terrible. We have no ability to really utilize the processes of Capitol Hill in order to ensure the right result now that we have something on the table. Those are things that need to be learned going forward because simply getting people activated in the first part is really step one. But I still think it's pretty good. Um, so why was it so successful? We boiled the issue down to simple terms. It was a very complicated issue, but we made it simple. In SOPA, it was also made very simple. In fact, it was perhaps even oversimplified in SOPA. But in SOPA, the issue was SOPA equals censorship. SOPA means that your websites that you currently go to, you won't be able to go to. SOPA hurts innovation. Those are the type of arguments that came out during SOPA. Um, and I'm sure you guys in this room can think of a few handful of others. But those are very simple terms rather than kind of the abstract intricacies of the DNS system and the IP system that I had to deal with working on Capitol Hill. Number two, we leveraged social media just like in SOPA. Oh, we weren't as good as in SOPA. Um, I, we had one video on unlocking, and that video was the number one video produced by Reason TV for the year. Um, we would have liked to have had more video content. We didn't have that capacity. But it shows that video is much more um, di engaging than other forms of, of media. We had a diverse coalition. We eventually gained mainstream credibility. We were emailing reporters left and right, and no one cared about the story. And we couldn't get anyone's attention. And then the White House petition hit 100,000 signatures, and myself and the other guy, Sina Conifar, we, we basically had to turn our phones off the hook. I mean, <laughs> it was CNN, and it was, it was, it was uh, New York Times, and every outlet across the country that wanted to talk about this issue suddenly. 
Uh, we were able to get it on that mainstream level, but that was because of the White House's response. It was because of the petition and the White House's response. We created a, a, a media spectacle. Uh, number six is also important. We had this measurable demonstration of support, which was that White House petition, which is more than just a lot of letters to Congress. We actually had something tangible. Kept Congress in the loop and avoided the issue of piracy. Talked about competition, innovation, property rights. So I actually presented this at a conservative organization, and uh, I got called a Marxist. <laughs> they said, oh, you're, you're just against contracts, and this is about subsidized phones. And I went on Fox Business, and they said the exact same thing to me, basically, they didn't use the word Marxist. Uh, but they said, uh, you know, you're just against contracts. And so that was an issue that we had to weigh carefully in on this issue, was that we aren't against contract law. Whenever you take up a campaign, you have to know where your third rails are. On this issue, we knew our third rails was subsidized phones and contract law. And our response was that that's between you and your carrier, but the federal government should not be arresting people for violating their contracts. You know, you're not arrested for violating your contract on your lease or on your mortgage. We deal with those through civil penalties and through contract law. I mention that because these are issues that you're going to encounter going forward on CISPA or on um, you know, CFAA reform or any of these other issues. You have to know where your third rails are and how to navigate them properly. Um, these are other reasons why it was, it was successful. It's very unfair. We dealt with the contract law argument through math and logic. <laughs> um, talked about innovation. Um, now, this is kind of the why. Why did I talk about this issue? It was more than just that it affected 23 million Americans. I approached this issue because I thought it was a small, winnable battle that would make Congress for the first time question the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. If we get a hearing out of this issue before they pass the bill, that's a win. Because in that hearing, they're going to bring in some of the experts to talk about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. To most members of Congress, this is the first time that they were aware that by default, we have a law that effectively bans new technologies. It's a pretty crazy statute that we've developed. And members of Congress were so unaware that this is what it took to put that on their radar, is thousands of their constituents writing to them about this issue. And now they're aware of the accessibility technology for the blind, of the jailbreaking issue. Some of them are aware of the issues relating to cryptography research. Um, Number four, the biggest impediment to fixing this problem is international treaties, which again is the back door of the content industry. And I wanted this issue to put that front and center because I knew that conservatives in particular, who are naturally skeptical of international law and treaties, once they learn more about this issue, would start to question the TPP treaty. Want to have oversight hearings of the TPP treaty. Saying we've already locked ourselves in these intellectual property laws going forward. What are we locking ourselves in with this new treaty? And the last one's also, also important, is we figured out what groups want to move forward with positive activism rather than just responding to the next SOPA. So this was the reason why I took on this issue overall. Uh, just a little bit more about why it's important. Um, this is kind of my, my, my point from the Atlantic article um, that summed up my entire argument for the campaign, that a free society shouldn't have to petition the government every three years to allow access to technology that are ordinary and commonplace. This is actually a similar doctrine to freedom of speech, which is that you can't ban, freedom of spe you can't ban someone's freedom of speech unless you have an overwhelming and compelling governmental interest. I think we should have a similar standard in this country for what technologies we ban. And we can have, a decision, we can have an intellectual discussion about the government not being able to ban any technologies. But I think that this is a kind of a, a middle ground that talks about this argument. And these are kind of my next steps going forward. Uh, but I would rather hear some questions from you guys, talk about some of the issues that you're engaged with, such as CFAA reform um, and CISPA, and, and see how I could help you kind of leverage my knowledge of DC, issues that you're interested in. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words on CFAA just before I go to questions, which is, um, the statute's terrible. It's widely acknowledged as being terrible. I think there's a consensus across the lost the left and the right that's terrible. But no one's written about it in Weekly Standard or National Review. No one's written about it in some of the, the or, or the, the Hill or in Politico. And so it hasn't really reached that level of attention to members of Congress. 
So a real problem with CFAA reform is that most members of Congress who are frankly unfamiliar with technology, their understanding right now of cybersecurity is that the sky is falling. Because I worked in three separate Congresses, or two year cycles, three separate Congresses, and each Congress we had people talk to us about the new cybersecurity legislation. I mean, there are a whole bunch of different versions of it. And now the CISPA bill. And each time it was saying, you know, the Chinese are stealing billions of dollars of intellectual property. Just about a month ago, members of the Supreme Court, their, their, their work accounts, internal deliberations of the Supreme Court were hacked into by Anonymous. Many members of Congress have had their accounts compromised by the Chinese or by other, other, other groups. Frankly, many of them deserved it because their default password was on every computer, but it's a side story. But that's, so that's what every person in Congress is hearing about cybersecurity. The difficulty with CFAA is that essentially, I don't mean to be flib when I'm saying this, but essentially the arguments for CFAA are we need to reduce the DOJ's discretion. We need to reduce their ability to deal with computer hacking. In Washington parlance, we need to water down computer hacking statutes. That framing is deadly. And I think we're all intellectual in this room enough to know that that's not actually what we're talking about. But until you defeat that framing, we're going to have difficulty with CFA reform, which we already saw from Goodlatte's bill, which actually made the CFA worse. And there are a few ways on how you actually accomplish that. Uh, I think the easiest way is have a meeting with Chairman Rogers or John McCain or um, you know the other like hawks on cyber issues, the ones who have been telling these members of Congress that the sky is falling, and convince them that the CFA needs to be reformed. Convince them that we can more accurately target hacking through a statute that is narrowly tailored towards that objective, rather than one that makes everyone in the United States a criminal. And if you have someone like John McCain or Chairman Rogers or Mac Thornberry making these arguments on the right, accompanied by other guys on the left, that's an argument that helps to defeat that narrative. Because if it's Chairman Rogers, the chair of the Intel Committee, who's saying that this is actually going to help us deal with computer hacking, then it's not watering down computer hacking statutes. And I'll take questions from you guys. To what extent trying to fracture the opposition is a valid strategy? I mean, you know, MPAA and RIA would like to like to make everybody think they represent the entire content creation industry yeah. in the U.S., but I'm sure they don't. There's plenty of people who are content creators who agree with you and not with them. Same with same with cell phone companies. I mean, Verizon, AT&T may want to prohibit unlocking, but I bet every second and third tier uh, cell carrier below them is in favor of it. So to what extent can you drive a wedge into the opposition? That, that's exactly right. When you find those actors, put it in your back pocket. Um, I was at the Consumer Electronics Show. I was on the stage with Hank with Public Enemy, and he was right next to me talking about my arguments as being pro-artist. Um, I can say all day that my position is pro-artist. Having an actual artist say that these positions are pro-artist is much better than me saying it. You're absolutely right. The RAA's policies do not foster new innovation in the music industry or in the movie industry. They do not actually help their own clients because they're in favor of their biggest clients over their new clients. Um, and on the issue of the unlocking, um, there are over 100 wireless carriers in this country, and we were able to get, I think it's 100 of them, on our side leaving AT&T and Verizon on the other side, which, which carefully wedged the issue as the big companies versus all the innovative companies or small businesses. So you're, you're absolutely right. So um, at the beginning, you sort of framed this as, you know, people who understand technology, you know, seem to get it and, uh, and come out with, you know, Maybe it's just self-referential, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, and. Uh, and, and so, so I mean, I guess that that, that kind of framing uh, is perhaps a um, sort of an optimistic framing mm -hmm. that uh, suggests that if we can educate people, that then uh, they might take more uh, common sense approaches to dealing with technology on the legislative end. So I yes, guess yes and no, because if you're ignorant on Capitol Hill that means that you listen to people that you trust. 
And unfortunately, the MPA and RAA and Chamber of Commerce are the ones that people on Capitol Hill trust on content industry issue, content issues. So that ignorance means that they're not going to question that that logic. But I guess I want to push a little more cynically to say, you know, what's your sense about people on Capitol Hill who, regardless of whether they're ignorant or not, that even if they were educated and understood exactly what the technology, uh, how it works mm -hmm. and what it means, uh, that ultimately what they care about is that the RIAA and MPAA uh, know people who can give them money and, uh, and ultimately that's what's important is the re-election cycle and ultimately getting the technology right or wrong is less important than ensuring that your coffers are free. Well, I, I didn't mean to imply that everyone on Capitol Hill is ignorant. There's many, many members of Congress who get it, and there are some members of Congress who get it and do exactly what you're saying. Um, so Marsha Blackburn comes to mind. She's from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm sure she understands the issues. Um, she's on the, on the other side of the issues. Um, she called my paper radical. Um, that's her perspective. Um, so there are people on the other side who, who do get the issues. But for the most part, you have Zoe Lufgren, Jared Paulus, Daryl Issa, uh, uh, Chaffetz, Senator Morin, uh, Senator Wyden. Those are kind of the guys who understand tech policy in the collective, both left and right, Senate and House. And they all kind of agree on many of the issues at hand. Um, so I think that there is some, some issues as far as that coffers argument goes. Uh, and, and campaign funding, but that doesn't explain why on the right Republicans support these policies. Because the MPA, RAA, Hollywood is very, very left-leaning. So if it's what you're saying, then why are Republicans um, against this? I think the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, I don't know enough about left politics that may explain why some Democrats are the way they are. I just know from my perspective it doesn't explain why Republicans are the way they are. That's the last I've heard. I've uh, been working with their office, talking with their office, and I've last I've heard is they're planning on introducing a bill. Um, why is the RIA and the MPA so politically powerful? I mean, I've heard a lot of arguments saying, look, you know, the tech companies in terms of market capitalization are so much larger. You know, they're like, well, Google and Apple probably each have enough cash on hand to buy the entire recording industry, but they don't seem to have the political power. Is this just your lack of experience? Um, so I'm not an expert right. on this. There's people who know these issues better. Uh, but AT&T and Verizon are both the top 10 lobbying companies in the United States. They spend $32 million. Um, if I remember correctly, Google spends $6 million. Google is the number two biggest country company in the United States, right? Or up there, depending on how you rank in, see who's paying what taxes offshore. They're a big company. Um, AT&T and Verizon are not nearly as big. Um, so it's, it defi it, it, it's where you place your priorities, right? And no tech company really had a DC presence until Microsoft. Uh, when Microsoft was about to be broken up, they suddenly decided that they needed to invest in lobbyists. Uh, and they stayed in DC. Um, and since then, other companies have also done so. But none of them have really done so to the extent that Microsoft has. So I would argue that in general, tech companies do not spend uh, comparable resources to the content industry or anywhere near close particularly given their overwhelming size. So either either in dollars to dollars or in percentages. So if Silicon Valley really decided that's what they wanted to do, they could do so. The other problem is that what you find is a lot of these tech companies, because they know that they're new to the game, they're very careful in the battles that they wage. So if you're a tech company and you figured your way through patent law, why would you want to reform cap patent law? If you're Apple or Microsoft or even Google, why would you want to reform patent law? Now you know you know as these companies how screwed up patent law is, but you've invested so much money in your current system to manipulate patent law. I'm sorry to survive patent law <laughs> that there's no incentive for you to be saying we should have wholesale patent law change. Um, that was my initial thoughts. Oh, the other problem is 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 the RAA and MPAA, their funding mechanism is in such a, a unique way that they kind of only exist for this purpose. So when they sue kids and they make a million dollars, that million dollars doesn't go back to the artists. It goes back to their coffers to pay for new lobbyists. Um, they, it, when Spotify entered the United States, there was like a four-year negotiation period. And that was mainly quibbling, to my understanding, over equity. 
because the content company said, if you want to enter the United States, you have to give up equity in your company, which is kind of, in my mind, extortion. And Spotify entered the United States and gave away 8% of their equity to the record companies. Um, now, those record companies have told me that none of that money will ever go back to the artists. So <laughs> these, are, these are ways that are kind of self-funding this lobbying campaign, whereas the tech industry, you know, uh, in Seattle, they have to justify, should we be spending this much money on lobbying through Microsoft or, or you know, with Google? So it doesn't have the same funding stream. National trade agreements and uh, how the myth that's been spurned is that it hurts U.S. innovation. Uh, I'm originally from Pakistan. I spent about 22 years of my life there, and piracy is rampant. As in, I had a phone call with a friend of mine last week who said the transit, the submarine cable got cut and the telco blocked in torrents, and he couldn't watch an episode of yeah. uh, Game of Thrones. And so, my argument to you is, is not, none of those people would pay for this content in the current business model, anyways. Yeah, but. I've seen how it does affect U.S. innovation, as in these are massive number of consumers that consume this content never never paid for any of this. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, is if you have any thoughts on how, or as in or what you said about how it doesn't hurt innovation or how it's a it's a myth kind of thing. Well, I didn't mean to say it was a myth. Piracy is real, uh, but in those examples, those aren't textbook lost sales because they wouldn't have bought the content anyways. And we have intellectual conversations in this room on the impact on piracy. My point is, is on Capitol Hill, it's a non-starter. Uh, piracy is real, costs millions of American jobs. If you do anything that threatens that, you're kind of out of luck. Um, so I'm, I'm not quibbling with whether or not there is a problem with piracy. But I, I think that the obsession with piracy is the problem. So I, I did a few years in retail, which was terrible. I advise everyone to do a few years in retail, so that way they decide everything else from the rest of their life is better. Uh, and, and we'd have on the wall the shrink rate, the amount of merchandise that was going to walk out of that store. There's about 5% the store I went to, which is actually pretty good. So the idea that in the record industry or the movie industry, any piracy is the sky falling is kind of a, 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 a it's, it's erroneous. Every industry deals with theft. Every industry deals with these problems. And in the case of retail, they've actually they've actually paid money for the garment, so they actually are it's a net, it's a it's a different economic equation. So they're actually merchandise is walking out of there that they've actually it has a physical product to it. Um, so I, I that's that's my point on piracy is that piracy is real, but if your conversation's only on the topic of piracy, that doesn't justify a copyright term of life plus seventy years, or you know these fair use laws that are absurd. And what happens is these fair use laws are so absurd that if you have a new business model that deals with content, one side of the Rubicon is you have this profitable, thriving business model named Aereo. The other side of the Rubicon is you're liable for a trillion dollars in damages. So, <laughs> and you don't always know where that line is. That line's defined by the courts. Could you imagine going to a venture capitalist and saying, okay, so it's like a 50% chance here that we have this brilliant product or a 50% chance that we're going to be bankrupted in courts. That's not how innovation happens. That's a chilling effect upon innovation. So that's my argument. Can you talk a little bit about the role of public interest groups um, like EFF and um, public knowledge and how you see them fitting into where you'd like the small incremental movements on Capitol Hill to go? Yeah. So I'm, I'm big fans of public knowledge and EFF. Uh, their, their interest is in, in talking about all the issues that affect innovation and technology. And, and I think that you, you need something to supplement that. So public knowledge puts out a lot of good um, and, and bill texts how you could actually introduce a bill tomorrow to fix this problem. That's awesome. Um, but we need something more strategic to be taking some of the activists and the players already out there in the community to engage through the kind of lobbying processes. Um, I say lobbying with tongue, you know, because with, 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 I, don't, I don't like lobbying. I think that there's lobbying 2.0 that you can utilize here. But I don't think, EFF has done some of that. Um, but there's other organizations and people that can mount these kind of grassroots campaigns on these niche issues. And that, what? I fix it. I fix it? Mobilizing hundreds of thousands of service techs on these kinds of issues. And we can have jobs in every area. 
I mean, there's lots of jobs out there for people that are unlocking phones. You got Recellular in Ann Arbor, Michigan, unlocking five million cell phones a year. I mean, they employ hundreds of people. It's very easy that local level look at look at the jobs on the local level and then build it up. Cool. more um, generic or strategic question. We've been talking a lot about the coffee and framing, and I completely agree with you, it's super important. But you were mentioning how critical it was for the cell phone movement that you got to that sort of visually magic number on the petition, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the media wanted to talk to you. Et yep. et and that makes sense. What I'm wondering is, seen in conjunction with the Sun Tzuian Let's accumulate a series of small winnable victories rather than going for the grandstand play. Yep. Are you going to run into a sort of what have you done for me lately thing? Like, let's say that the next thing, yep. whatever it is, you get to 100,000, like, well, 100,000, we've seen that before. Like, if you, want, if you want to take our calls, oh, excuse me, receive our calls this time, it needs to be 150,000. And then the next time it needs to be two, et cetera. And mm -hmm. so you, you ha will you have to keep winning bigger and bigger? Or can you exist at this level for a while, subtly building support? I think you can exist at this level for a while, although there were some other petitions that happened after us, such as on CISPA. Um, but you have to be very strategic. So on the accessibility stuff, um, if we mount a campaign like this on accessibility, there are natural allies to utilize in that battle. Um, the Association for the Blind and Associations for the Deaf are, you know, just natural allies. Um, and if you hit that 100,000 barometer on that, and the White House has to weigh in about why we're denying uh, persons who are blind and deaf technology that can help them, um, I mean, good luck to them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if we're very lucky, we get a hearing on that issue. And so I feel like there's ways to, the, to, to continue on some of these small issues if you're strategic about it. Um, but then, yeah, you are going to have to move up to some bigger, bigger battles. I mean, you want to take on CFAA reform, that's a big battle. That could be a year or two year or five year battle. Um, but I think that this is going to be, you know, step one in a longer term process on that road. Can you talk more about multi-stakeholder uh, relationships in terms of the U.S.? When they, when they went for Wicked, they advocated for this, but domestically, it's been very difficult to form. And so, like, the CCI for copyright has a multi-stakeholder relationship. And uh, with the MPA and the ISPs, there's also uh, GG Sones in, in part of it from public knowledge and stuff like that. How, how, what the importance of such a relationship is, or what your thoughts are on it? I know GG pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, you need to have as many allies in the community as possible uh, and, and gain from their expertise. So Gigi's been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, there's, you know, technology, legal scholars who know these issues better than I do. Um, but you need people who can kind of connect the dots too. Um, so again, on the, 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 the unlocking issue, I feel like one of my added values was demonstrating that this make you liable for five years in prison. That required an added level of legal analysis um, that I was able to accomplish because of the multi-stakeholders, because I knew other people who could confirm my analysis and could say, if I got challenged on it, I could point to a Harvard professor, a Yale law professor, a Stanford professor, and a few other professors to say, like, don't take my word for it. We have all these other people in the community. So I think that, that there's rules for all these different, different um, did that answer your question? So my, my point was that instead of fighting all these big people and raising, uh, being on one oh, side rather than working them? with them, and then finding a better way to move forward, because like Gigi's working yeah. with at and Verizon and the MPA yeah. and representing a really good front for the consumers. I think that there are times where you can work with them. Um, so an issue that's near and dear to my heart is the issue of alien works. Um, I don't know how familiar all of you guys are with alien works, but essentially when copyright, there was a period of time where these copyrighted goods went in the public domain. And then the Sonny Bono Act, they decided to take those goods in the public domain and put them back under copyright. And as a result of that, but also other issues, but prime, but for the large part of that, we don't know who their descendants are today who should inherit those royalties. And so as a result, they're called the alien works because no one can use them, no one can benefit from them. Orphan works. Orphan works. Sorry, that's exactly what I meant. Sorry. Okay. Orphan works. Someone's going to tweet about that. Um, yeah, so that's a problem where we, our interests are aligned with the RAAs, or I would argue are 
not necessarily, yeah, we're aligned at least with the RAA's interest, which is that they want these holders to be compensated um, and want more content. We want more content to be available. Uh, we may quibble about how to do it, but um, if people in the REA wanted to work with me on um, Orphan Works, um, that's that's terrific. We have about eight minutes left, um, and there are a whole bunch of questions. So, um, I've heard some uh, discussions about the, uh, the internet freedom movement as being sort of analogous to the uh, environmental movement in the '60s and '70s in terms of. You know, people on different issues, but not having formed under a coherent banner. Yeah. Do you think that metaphor is accurate? How would you frame it? That's a. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the environmental movement, but I think there's lessons to be learned from all these movement politics issues. Um, you know, MoveOn.org was the first group that utilized online tools uh, for movement politics, and since then there have been many others. MoveOn.org actually was, I think, in 1998. Um, they were the, they were over Bill Clinton's impeachment. Most many people don't know that. Um, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, in the environmental movement. It could be one of them. Although I would I would wonder what's what went off the rails, and and what can be learned from their successes and their failures, um, because I think that in the past 10, 15 years there hasn't been very much progress in their front. Um, but I think that all these movements can teach us um, positive things. I'm interested in those Republican groups that endorsed your copyright memo, and the Republicans who call you a Marxist and got you fired. <laughs> is there a schism in, Repo in conservative thinking about copyright reform? And it looks like there is. And how does that map onto the schism of the Republican Party trying to regroup after the last election? So I haven't seen so much of a schism. I mean, I know the guys who call me a Marxist, um, and it wasn't an intellectual argument. It was, I was told to come to this meeting, call you a Marxist. Um, so the, the best argument I've heard, and, and I'm always interested in counter-arguments, the best argument I've heard against the memo is the natural rights argument, which is that copyright should exist forever, the federal government shouldn't be touching it, it existed before the Constitution, the federal government shouldn't be involved, you can't limit copyright. Um, that's an intellectual law school journal argument. It's just not the, art, it's just not the, it's not the, the system that we've adopted either in the United Kingdom, or so Great Britain, or in the United States. It's actually an argument that our founding fathers rejected. Um, they, they rejected it on the national level, they re rejected it in 14 colonies and then states, they rejected it at the Supreme Court level. Um, so that's the, the, the natural rights counter-argument that I've heard. Um, so I, I don't see the schism so far. But there are conservatives who support Memo. Absolutely. So, does that give hope to a left-right coalition for copyright reform? I think so. Is there any realistic hope there? You say we don't have any of the email addresses of the people who signed the petition. Yeah. But is there a growing coalition where we do have email addresses, where we have some organization? So, we have no organization to do that. I would like to build that. I've been trying to figure out funding to do that. Um, but again, that's a long-term battle. It's one thing for me to write that memo when I was in Congress because we had 175 members who could theoretically support that the next day. And I thought that was a worthwhile coalition to move forward on these issues on. But out of Congress, that's a longer term battle. And that's going to require developing the apparatus on. Because you're talking about uh, many billion dollars of assets at stake. I mean, if, if the RAA estimates that the impact of my reforms would cost their industry $10 billion, why wouldn't they spend a billion dollars lobbying? Oh, I'm sorry. But you know, so talking about the email addresses, um, so you don't have those 114,000 email addresses, but the White House does. So do you get any conservative pushback for using the White House petition platform? I got some pushback. I don't know how much of it was conservative pushback. I got a lot of privacy pushback. Um, but yeah, there were some conservatives who didn't want the White House to have their email information. Can you win small battles? And then the other side, whatever that other side might be, uh, then follows up with something more drastic. And my example here is the recent Supreme Court ruling on first doctrine. Yeah. Uh, we don't for sale doctrine. We don't know yet what the content owners are going to do next, but it's probably going to be drastic. So when we when we make small strides, how can we defensively prepare for the next big terrible thing that's going to come out? Is there anything we can do to prepare? So that's a good point. So. 
we should be willing to pay defense, even on the big battles. But we need to be strategic on the offensive battles. Um, I'm not sure if I buy your premise that they're going to introduce, if they're going to try for a sustained push to reverse the first sale doctrine that Kurt's saying. Um, but yeah, you, you do need to have your eyes open. Uh, but if you want to take on a big battle like on CISPA, um, without that coalition, um, it's it's difficult. So it, it, right now with the CISPA stuff, it seems like it's um, you know you shouldn't pass CISPA because of the um, the privacy concerns, and I get that. But cybersecurity versus privacy, cybersecurity probably wins. You you need to figure out a strategic argument that says. This has privacy concerns, and this is ineffective to deal with cybersecurity. Optimally, and here's a better solution. Um, so that's kind of what I meant. Um, what would you have us do, do in the short term? Do you have anything in, any, anything in particular that we can engage in or um, push forward? Sure. I mean, so my, my short term goals are I want to figure out what actors who rose up during SOPA would like to be part of a new moving coalition going forward to fight on these small scale battles. Uh, and, and, and we have a website which is called legalizedtech.com that we haven't launched. And its premise is just that technology that doesn't have an infringing purpose should be legal, uh, which I think is a interim battle along the way. Um, but if you're interested in kind of connecting those dots, connect with me. If you're interested in, in helping with some of these campaigns or if you think that accessibility technology for the blind is important, um, those are kind of the next battles that I'm mounting up for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.